I have the delight to do now is to introduce Karen George to you, who is head at Westfield Junior School. Um, and you're going to be talking about reimagining learning and the steps that you're taking as a school on the journey towards achieving that, that vision. Okay. So over to Karen, and then later I shall be introducing Steve, who's sitting at the front. Okay. So I'm just going to say welcome and start with the video. Order, order. How many years has it been since you were last in a junior school? What do you remember about your school days? Do you even know what a junior school is like today? It's a bit different nowadays, you know. What is the first thing you think of when you pick your old classroom? Probably the squeak of chalk on a board and the world in black and white. Our lives are much more colourful. We use whiteboards which make our learning more exciting. We can share our work and access pictures and films, often of ourselves. We can use the power of the internet, investigate our planet and learn with others through video conferencing. All that and no squeaking, not even from the mouse. Chalkboards, textbooks and the occasional TV programmes helped you to learn. Now we are used to learning a new and exciting way. OK, well... As Pete said, I'm Karen George and I'm head of Westfield Junior School in Yateley and I'm, I'm also privileged enough to work in a number of national networks with colleagues from all key stages, um, academics and uh, researchers looking at how education needs to change to meet the needs of third millennium learners. But what keeps me my feet on the ground is the fact that I still work in a school. Now that little video clip there is part of a larger um, piece of film that was made by the little girl that you saw uh, that when she was eight. She wrote that in McDonald's, believe it or not, with her mother to showcase some of the work we do at the school because I asked children if they could, could tell us in whichever form they wanted to and she just left this script on my desk so we made it into a film. Now, um, before, I just, before I begin, I just want to find out a little bit about um, the audience so I know who I'm talking to because then I can change what I'm going to say depending on who's in the audience. How many are you, of you are teachers currently? Okay, two. <laughs> Lecturers at universities, okay. Um, anybody from industry? Anybody from abroad? It's come today, okay. Well, you'll have seen in that film as Michael Gove, our current education secretary, who's obviously just published a controversial um, curriculum, um, which is having a lot of debate at the moment, a new national curriculum, which we're allowed to comment on, national being the operative word, because not every school has to do it. Um, but. What I want to talk about is how traditional mechanisms of teaching need to change radically. It's not about reshaping what we've currently got, it's about doing something completely different. Um, so, this is my school, Westfields Juniors in North Hampshire. It's basically a scola building on an overextended housing estate. It's just a massive housing estate. Now, I came into education because I, I wanted to make a difference. At least that's what I came in for, and I'm guessing most people um, in my industry have done just that. They come into teaching because they want to make a difference. And yet, despite everything we've done, 18% of young people are leaving education at the minimum age of leaving. That's nearly one in five children. They're not engaged with learning and they're leaving, saying it's more akin to something that their parents or their grandparents went to, where they were told if you work hard and you pass your exams, you'll get your dream job at the end of it. That's Nearly one in five children, how shocking is that? And younger children saying they don't want to stay, despite all our best efforts. Worrying. Now, the difficulty is that the world is changing. The children are not the same as our parents or grandparents. Technology has reshaped the world. Technology and entrepreneurs have reimagined the world. And so our children aren't the same, the world isn't the same, the jobs they're going to go into are not going to be the same. So should our schools be the same? Now let's just, what I want to do now is just bring into your stream of consciousness so that you're really clear about the changes that I'm talking about. Um, the changes that, that we just, ass just assimilate without really bringing into our conscious mind. So let's just talk about dream jobs. Can anybody tell me when they were young what they thought they wanted to be for their dream job? Anybody? I'm going to walk away from this podium. I've been told I'm not allowed to. Go on, then. Tell us. A writer. You wanted to be a writer, okay? A ballet dancer. A ballet dancer. Miles? Computer programmer. 
Ah, hello, you did. You, you got your dream job. Okay. So for some people, they get their dream jobs, but dream jobs are changing. They're radically changing. So what I want to do is talk to you, first of all, about the, the, shape, the, the shifting changes in the job market and the types of jobs our children are going to have. And then we'll look at the shifting changes in the um, personal possessions that we have and then in the young and what they're doing. So let's have a look at dream jobs and what dream jobs our children could be attaining. So the next dream job could be this. Our children could be a space pilot. Why not? That's reality. After all, didn't Will I Am just a few weeks ago launch a song from Mars? I've actually written to him this week because I thought, well, if he's done it, I need him. I need him to talk to my children in my school. So I've just written to him. So, you know, who would have thought just a few years ago that we would have uh, songs that were streamed from Mars? That's reality. Lots of children dream about perhaps joining the police force. There's 13 types of police in our country at the moment, isn't there? There's CID, there's traffic, there's child protection. Okay, what about this type of police, police person? That's gonna happen. We're gonna have children who go into that job. Or my personal favorite, and I heard Jane, I was in Jane's um, workshop listening to um, basically your digital, how you want to portray yourself in the digital world. And this is another job, personal brand. I quite fancy this one. So it's interesting hearing Jane's, if any of you went to Jane's talk, about yourself, the way you portray yourself. So digital branders. So the jobs of the future are changing. And isn't that interesting? Now, what about the facilities that we use? How are they changing? How are the facilities that we or our goods or our possessions changing? They're changing around us and sometimes we don't realise. So I wanted to talk about something and I wanted to think of a facility that we all have that you'll all recognise. So I've been walking around with my toilet seat. I won't go too far from the podium, but I've been walking around with my toilet seat. We all have a toilet, don't we, at home. So can anybody tell me what are the major changes that have happened to your toilet in the last 10 years. You've all seen one, had one in your houses at whichever country you come from. So Universal, what changes? Talk to your partner next door to you and come up with any changes that you've noticed in the toilet seat, in the, oh, the toilet, not the toilet seat, in the last 10 years. Anybody? It's got smaller. It's got smaller. Less yeah. water. Less water. Anything else? Go on, say it. It doesn't matter. I've had it. You know, this is not a flash in the pan talk. <laughs> so I've had it all. Go on, go for it. What were you going to say? You wanted to say something? No? Me, I, no, I would just say mine's broken. That's the ah. <laughs> Oh, well, I can tell you your next toilet to buy in a minute because I've been researching. Anybody else? Choice of flush. Choice of flush, yep. It's one of those ones that goes like that. It closes, beautifully. closes beautifully, yep. You can have automatic. Anybody else? Okay, I want to show you a toilet that in 2002 in Japan, more of these toilets were sold than people owned personal computers. How about that? And, okay, it's called the Washlet. Now, the Toto Washlet is the throne of all thrones. It's the one that you really want, okay? There are all sorts of washlets out there on the market and I went onto Amazon this morning and you can buy a cheaper version on Amazon, but the real one that you want is the Toto Washlet from Japan. Let me explain why. So let's see, you know, because technology and entrepreneurs are reimagining our world. So what we need is, because I'm a teacher, I want you to do some imagining with me. I want you to come with me on this journey, okay? And we are going to use this toilet together. Okay, just bear with me. Okay, so how do I get this up again? I knew I wouldn't be able to escape, okay. <coughs> right, so I want you to imagine that we're in the dead of night and I want you to imagine that it's cold. So let's have a little bit of, let's have a bit of music here to help us along our way. Okay, so the wind, it's raining. Can we have, that? can it be darkened a little bit because it's night? Can we darken the room a little bit. You're able to dim the lights a little bit because Imagining helps if you can do all these things at the same time. No, you can't dim our lights for us. Okay, you just have to shut your eyes and pretend then. So it's about three o'clock in the morning, okay? And you need the toilet. Now, some of you are not going to be with me because you're too young to know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night and need the toilet, you'll be with me on this one, okay? And you don't want to wake your partner, all right? Because it's dark. So 
you feeling your way towards your bathroom where your toilet is and this toilet this washlet will light up like the right like you know like the runway for an aircraft it will light up for you showing you the way because it's got sensors in the bowl now as you get near to the toilet because of the sensors that are all the way around the lid will lift silently you know all those arguments you've had about you know seat up seat down lid up lid down with your house forget it you know don't need to this will do it for you and because it is intuitive with these sensors around the toilet bowl it will know intuitively whether you are going to sit or stand now for the purpose of this demonstration we are going to sit okay i will try not to be too indelicate so as you sit on this toilet seat it will warm to the ambient temperature in the middle of winter in england how fantastic is that because there are sensors a data bank that will store the data and the warmth of the seat that you would like so you're on your toilet seat and it's warm and it's cozy and it's lit its way up for you and you haven't woken your partner how brilliant it is also a green product so you don't need to use toilet paper because it will wash and it will dry you and as you get up from the toilet seat the, the smell of fragrant flowers will follow you. Now, what more can you want than a toilet like that? £1,500, it is a snip. It is a bargain. You can buy cheaper versions on Amazon at 495 but you won't get it all singing and dancing. Now, entrepreneurs don't stop there, do they? They come up with other ideas. So what's happened now is that they've put medical sensors in the toilet. Anybody from the medical profession in here? Because if you are, you'll love this, right? You'll love this. They've put medical sensors in the toilet and an internet cellular telephone. And what that will do is it will analyze your waste product to tell you whether you've got urinary tract infections, onset diabetes, and it will send that information, that analysis, to your doctor's surgery who can prescribe you the medication you need before you even know you're ill. Now, isn't that brilliant? That's what you call a toilet. And that's on sale now. They haven't actually... Um, you can't buy the second part. You can, they haven't got the um, internet cellular telephone in England, so you can't do that bit yet. But that's what technology is doing for us. It's reimagining our world. And if I can reimagine it with a toilet, what else can happen? That's fantastic. So, so, so far, we've got, we've got our jobs changing. We've got our facilities that we're using changing. What about the way that we are and the young people? In the, in the country are changing. Now, Mary Meeker, I don't know whether you've heard of Mary Meeker, um, who works for the venture capital firm, KP, uh, KCP, um, CB, I think it is, um, and a widely present, in a widely shared presentation, talked about the changes and trends in technology for, and the way people are using technology for people that are 25 and under. Anybody here 25 and under? Hooray, okay, okay, well then you can tell me if this is right or not. And she talks about two types of generation, the asset light generation and the asset heavy generation. Sadly, I'm on the asset heavy side, which really upset me. Um, and what that means is that I'm the sort of person in my house that will still own books. I will have CDs, DVDs. I will have objects. I've still got my watch because I can't quite let go of it. Whereas the asset light generation are using more of the cloud to store their documents. They're streaming information far more than ever before. Um, and they're, you know, their DVDs, they're using Netflix. They can go a long way with a mobile phone and not having any money. And you know, I'd still have to make sure I've got money in my purse. Um, whereas they're quite happy to use everything through PayPal and buy their goods and services. So they don't need the clutter of everyday life that I, I as a person of my generation, the asset heavy generation would have. Now, isn't that interesting for, you know, 25 year olds don't need all that clutter. So Mary Meeker wanted to walk in the shoes of a 25 year old and Oh, let me get rid of that. Sorry, otherwise we're going to be in rave clouds again. And let's get back to my presentation. Slow everything down. So she wanted to walk in the, the shoes of a 25-year-old. So let's us, let's us do the same and see what a 25-year-old and people who are 25 or under tell me if this is right. So everybody that's that age, is that true? Does that, does, does that have resonance with you? Okay. So you don't need the clutter of everyday life. Goods and services are coming to you. So 
Interestingly, while, while this is happening, however, schools are moving very slowly, four times more slowly in some schools, which is worrying. And yet, we've got young children who are using technology in interesting ways. They're coming to our schools with skills unlike anything we see, have, we've seen before. They're motivated to, to learn in a way that most educationalists would really envy. Um, they're uploading information to Wikipedia and becoming experts in their own right. Take Jonathan James, for example, who at just 15 years old managed to hack into the Department of Defense in America and steal the source codes for the NASA space station. If he'd been an adult, they'd have put him in prison, but they didn't know what to do with him because he was 15. So they just took away his computer and put him under house arrest while they tried to work out what to do with him. You know, technically savvy young people are using social media to begin their businesses. They're using technology to shape their lives. So my message when I go around talking to schools is, are we leading the way in schools or are we being led? And I keep using that mantra because it's, it's a worry. Um, Ken Robinson in The Element talk, points out that digital technology is in the hands of millions of people and so is its creative use. So I want to show you a piece of creative use by a group of nine and ten year olds who bought this video to me and said, look, Mrs. George, you know, we were working in school and you were sh you know, showing us how to do um, story settings and things like that. Look what we've produced. And they did it in a different way. This was not homework. It was nothing they were asked to do. This is what they bought to me. So I thought I'd show you. Isn't that brilliant? And I encourage children to bring the things home that at home they made. One child came to me, I'm completely off my script now, but I always do that. One child came to me recently and said, Mrs. George, I'm good at blowing up things. I said, are you? He said, yes, I thought we'd go around the school together and blow up everything that you're unhappy about and you've got a blowing up app. So he was a child that wasn't very engaged in learning. It took a lot to make him engage, but he got this app. So he, I said, well, write a script for me. He doesn't like writing. And we'll go around and we'll blow up everything we're unhappy about. So we did. We blew up litter in the playground. We blew up uh, coats on the floor. And he, but he wrote the script for it. So engaging children in different ways through technology has a massive potential. So what does all this change mean to the children and the classes that some of the teachers are going to go into on Monday morning? It means that if those teachers do not help those children in the way that they need to be, they're going to go, the children themselves are going to be competing against people across the globe who are really talented and motivated. And so those teachers need to teach those children to be world class because if they don't, who will? We might not know what the future holds, but there are two things we can be certain of. One, gaining ex high grades in examinations alone is not going to guarantee them a job, their dream job, their future job, whatever they want. Who, you know, think about accountants. Why is any company going to pay uh, an accountant £20 an hour, somebody who's got a really good degree in accountancy, when companies can ship those accounts, internet, that put through the internet, send them to another country and pay somebody equally as talented across the globe a tenth of the price? Lots of jobs are moving. So we've got to play much more cleverly with our students and explain to them how this world is going to work. Also, our students and our children are going to be facing some of the um, biggest problems the world has ever seen. Climate change, and I think there's a, a, a talk at Plymouth University on climate change at the moment. There's climate change. They're going to be looking at famine, wars, destruction of life beneath the ocean wave. So if they only leave school thinking our thoughts, then nothing much is going to change. Okay. Third millennium learners need to be digitally literate. Anyone can publish anything. So we've got to teach the, our, our students and our children how to exam, examine the information they find. We need to teach them to connect with each other through the internet, locally, globally, and nationally. 
because a collective sharing of our understanding can help to solve some of these world's biggest problems. It will also help our children to understand what it's like to work with people who come from a very different geographical, historical, cultural perspective and to value those opinions of people around the globe. And that's really, really key. Now, I know that um, Michael Barber, in his, um, one of his papers, Michael Barber at Al, Al talks about, uh, in Oceans of Innovation, talks about the fact that um, the young have the greatest investment to make in peacekeeping for the 21st century. After all, lots of us in this room will be gone. Isn't that a sobering thought? So, what do our children need for the future? Well, interestingly, it's not a list of subjects. Apart from literacy, you probably couldn't count, anything of those, um, uh, count any of those as subjects. The most striking thing of this is that their you know, values, skills, habits of mind. The, the whole point of, do, of, of learning um, statistics, for example, is not to pass an exam, but it's to intelligently manage the risk in your life. We need to motivate and engage our learners so that with activities that are real and relevant. And technology can do this in a way that um, is otherwise difficult to achieve. However, one of the problems that we have in education is our assessment system. And the Nesta report of 2012 made a, a very valid quote and pointed that out. I'll just give you a minute to read that. Okay, so how are we going to engage our learners with the skills that they need? What are we going to do to help them? Well, at Westfields, one of the ways that we've done this is to try and introduce children to, um, we want real audiences, so we've bought in a radio station. And we've changed the parents' assembly because we have loads of events where parents come into school and our parents often say, you know, we just can't come into all of these things. So we've changed the parents' assembly to the parent broadcast. And our parents, it means that our parents, our children, our grandparents, anybody who lives here or abroad, and the general public, public at large can listen to their radio broadcasts. Radio station, as you can see, the children named it, called School Radio, because children are, are much more inventive than we are. Although I have to say, they went to name, for those of you interested in the health um, industry, we went to name our, our cafeteria, and I had to veto that because they wanted to call it Stuff You Light, which I thought was a, a little worrying. Anyway... Let's listen to one of their radio broadcasts. Welcome to the World News. The top stories today are murder mystery in Mexico, Italy cruise ship disaster, missing motorbikes in Yately, Taysom Sea Spillage, Kim Kardashian split with husband, and Euro 2012 update from Poland. Breaking news, on the 8th of January 2012, San Patricio Malacqua, Robin Woods, 58, was shot. Police have discovered that the super shooter shot Robin at exactly 11.15pm. Two armed and masked men broke into Robert's private home to steal what they could. Mr Wood tried to stop the robber stealing his laptop bag and this is what caused Robin's death. We spoke to Daniel Patman, a trustworthy resident, and he said the following. There is plenty of crime in the area and because there are less jobs, more criminals are appearing looking for some easy money. They think that foreigners are all rich and compared to some Mexicans, they are and that they are easy pickings. I think that this was a pointless death that could have been avoided if Mr Woods had simply let the thieves take what they wanted. OK, so this was a broadcast and the way it was done to engage the children. Every child in the um, class was asked to identify somebody that they knew across the world, a friend or a relative, and, and to find someone or we found somebody for them. And then those, pair, um, those people in January on one particular day were asked to send in from across the world, we pinpointed on a map where all these um, stories came from, were asked to send in a real story was that, that was happening in their neighbourhood. So this was a real story. The children then had to write a journalistic report based on that story. They were so engaged because they had individuals who were telling them stories that were real. Nobody held back, I have to say. You know, you've got murder in Mexico and all the rest of it. They didn't look at the age of the children. They gave them the real stories. Then we asked the children to say, OK, you've done that into a journalistic report. So how would you do that for a radio show? How would you, what would the script look like? How would you write that? What are the nuances of tone 
and silence in radio reports. How are you going to do that? Real skills for life. Children are intrinsically motivated to learn when the activities are real. And real audiences for learning give children that buzz that they need to want to work and try and develop their resilience because they've got real people listening to them. So we're lucky at Westfields in that we have lots and lots of visitors um, and we encourage visitors. We, we want to be a school for the community. So there is always somebody walking in and out of school doing something, working with our children. Um, and we ask, parent, we ask our children to anybody that comes in, gets interviewed. If you come into school, you will be interviewed by somebody in the radio station. So imagine asking children between the ages of 7 and 11 to interview an amputee or to interview a young woman whose husband has just died in Afghanistan who wants the school to help them raise money for Help the Heroes. You can listen to those broadcasts on our website because our children, all of our children, do just that. Now you might think, well, well how old are they? Is that realistic? But these are real skills for life that we want our children to have. And we believe it's really important. I'm always sad as a head teacher that, that um, people put a ceiling on my children's talents and abili abilities and that there are programs written for certain age groups. So when I was asked would my children like to take part in the Apps for Good program, traditionally this program is designed for 11 to 18 year olds, I jumped at the chance. I really wanted my children to, to be able to do this. Why? Well, there were three key reasons. It allows children to work in teams to agree the issues they want to solve and to tackle them. So it's got, you know, teamwork. It's got all those skills for life that I was talking to you about that I believe are important. They get to work with real experts, designers, developers and entrepreneurs. And more importantly, they're using technology for a real purpose. The best app goes towards a, a, an award ceremony and then the best of all those apps actually has their app um, fully developed and designed. So I think let's have a look at some of the talk about some of the apps that um, my children are in the process of designing or are designing. The first one that I think is wonderful, there's lots, so I've just picked three to tell you about. One, the first one that I came across was a group of children, and it was an interesting bunch of children. It was children who um, had found learning difficult, and, and theirs was one of the sharpest designs. Uh, had got some really detailed elements in it. They designed an app that is the Allergic Alert app. I have to say that again, allergic alert app. It's taken me a lot to practice that. I said to them when I, when I said, could I take, talk about your app? You could have chosen an easier title for me to talk about. And basically what this app involves is that when you go abroad on holiday and you come across food, because food's very important in our school. We talk a lot about food. We eat a lot of food in our school as well. Um, you want to know if it's got anything in it that, will, uh, it will, is a, that you are allergic to, like nuts, for example. So this app that they've designed has a barcode scanner that will scan the ingredients and tell their parents through a traffic light system whether um, it will affect them or not and whether they can eat that product or not. You know, out of the mouths of babes. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Another group of children have designed a skate park app. So you can find where the nearest skate park is, but you can play a game. And you can actually, the game will be the exact um, replica of the park that you're going to. And by playing the game, you get to know all the nooks and crannies of, because I'm guessing it's important in, in, when you're skating, um, of, of this park before you even get there. That you can practice playing on it when your parent's driving you to this, this park for you to play. How brilliant is that? However, my favourite one is the Snoring Dog app, which I just thought was brilliant. How many of you have got dogs that snore? Anybody? Oh, good. I'm so pleased. I have two. OK, so I said to the children, what do you mean a Snoring Dog app? So what they explained to me is that, that this app is, they, a lot of the children appear to have dogs that snore and, and keep them awake. So I'm presuming that these dogs are sleeping somewhere near the vicinity of their bedrooms. And so the, children, the, the, the five children that were doing this, they said, so what we've designed is a game where, an app where when the dog snores and it reaches a certain decibel, it will emit a sound that we won't be able to hear, only the dog can hear, that'll wake it up. And I said, what happens after you've woken it up? Well, then we'll play music to it so it goes back to sleep again, but it won't wake us. I said, oh, what's the music? Now, they hadn't decided, but I'm guessing it'll be something like this. Who let the dogs out? OK, and uh, the children thought that was great. So whether that works or not, I think it probably needs more soothing dog music. But that's what they're working on at the moment, the snoring dog app. 
Now, coding, we've heard a lot about coding today. And, and if you were in Steve's session, you've been knitting. And I know there's some people that have proudly been showing their knitting off. Um, somebody on my table when I was in Jane Street had a fantastic piece that she'd knitted. And I know that people have, I'm, I'm afraid I wasn't so good there, Steve. I'm, I'm still struggling. And obviously, coding's uh, one of those things I'll be struggling with for, for a bit. But coding is another way of, uh, in which we help our children to understand the network world in which they're growing up in. And I think it's really important because it involves a new way of thinking about problem solving. And it helps our children understand the difference between artificial technology, uh, artificial technology, sorry, the artificial, um, the artificial intelligence, sorry, and human intelligence. And so we took a group of our children to Oxford University to work with Professor Peter Milligan on coding. And they did Java, Turtle Java. And we, they're also doing Scratch at school. And we are absolutely enthralled by the way the children have just taken to it and the games that they're trying to develop at the moment. Because it's really important that children see that logical pattern and have a go at it. And, and the bit that um, is really important is the developing the resilience. Because teaching children resilience is one of the biggest um, issues in school. So many children just give up at the first hurdle. But when they're involved in making a game or encoding in this way, they just keep wanting to go and go and go. And so we're really pleased because we don't want our children to be passive consumers of technology. We want them to use their creative skills to be involved in those industries that are going to reimagine the future. And so that's why we, allow, you know, we want our children to have um, these opportunities. And somebody was also talking to me today about, um, I think it was Dojo, Coda Dojo, which is another one. So I'll be looking into that. But certainly our children have been going to Oxford University and working with Professor Peter Milliken on coding, and they've absolutely loved it. And they've, you know, they're at school they're working doing Scratch. So anybody who's got, our young teachers are going to school and talking about that, keep going with it. It's really, really important. We hope they'll design a game one day as well, perhaps that will encourage children to learn. Now, gaming is really key because through generations, we've all played games. And gaming using technology has really taken on. And it's something in our schools that's really important. Again, it's a motivating factor like no other. So what, we use a lot of games in school. And one of the things that we've been using recently um, we, is trying to teach our children to be historical detectives. So we've been using um, a simulation game that uses its geo. It uses geolocation tracking and smartphones. And basically, it allows us to turn our field at the back of our school into an archaeological site for digging, um, a virtual archaeological site. Now, it's quite hard to explain this game, but it's a game where they piece together pieces of information and they can and have to work out through the internet whether what they're finding with their metal detectors are actual Roman artifacts or not. And eventually, they end up, if they piece all the pieces of the puzzle right together, they end up finding a Roman villa sighted on the back of our school playground uh, field. Isn't that brilliant? So let's play you this video, and then you can see a little bit more about the type of gaming that our children are involved in. interesting is that than just asking children five key questions and saying right now go and research it on the internet actively involving them actively discussing developing those skills for life now John Hattie in his book um, visible learning um, for teachers talks about the critical role that teachers have to play and um, their impact on not only their students but the environment and do they know what they're actually how they how they're the effect that they're having 
So what evidence-based methods do we use in my school? One of the things that we have is um, an Irish system. That's the long bit there that you can see with the, the camera at the front. And it's an unobtrusive piece of technology that we use to record our children and our teachers. And the moment what we're using it for, it has, you can use it for a whole range of things, but this year what we've been using it for, for about a year and a half now, is um, identifying the children in our, our, our school that are stuck or stalled or that don't seem to be engaged with learning. And the teacher basically uses this piece of technology to record their lessons. Now, because this can be moved anywhere in the school, the children are so used to seeing it after they've seen it once or twice, they, they, they don't worry because it's always somewhere around the school, whether it's on or off. Um, basically, then, it gives the teacher then takes that film and goes and sits with our inclusion manager. And using what we call a YYY sheet, they analyse the child's reaction to the learning that's, uh, and to the learning and to the lesson that's taking place. And then what they do is they try to see what the teacher is doing and how that is affecting the child and the environment in which that child is working. And can we change that? Now, it takes a very open person to share their work, to discuss it openly, and to try and reflect on what they can do better. But how do you know how you teach until you've seen yourself? I don't know uh, how many lecturers actually um, videoed themselves teaching and seen their impact on their students and done exactly the same. But it's a really useful piece of um, research for our <coughs> teachers. You know, because we're always telling children, the, you know, the cutting edge of your learning is when you make mistakes. So isn't it the same for teachers? The cutting edge of their learning is when they make mistakes. And shouldn't they be able to talk about that openly with colleagues in an environment that is open and willing to do that? So we use this piece of technology an awful lot. Another way of making learning visible is through capture and share technology. Um, as teachers, we use words that children don't always understand, young, young children, because we bring to bear our years of experience with the words that we use. You know, how many teachers say to young children, behave appropriately? What does that mean? What does the word behave, what does the word appropriately mean? We've actually spent years bringing our, um, you know, the history that comes with us together to understand certain words, and yet we expect children from a very young age to hear a word that we've said over and over again once and to know what it means. And we're often upset when they don't behave appropriately, um, you know, according to our, our, our words. So therefore, through the use of screencasts, our children are documenting their learning by recording their explanations. And what that allows teachers to do is to hear the misconceptions that um, children have and then to give feedback straight away in order to, uh, to, to stop those misconceptions and close that, that gap in their learning. The children then, through re review and refinement of those screencasts, upload them onto our um, learning platform to share with other children, with parents, and other teachers use them in their lessons as part of flipped learning. Uh, and this has proven to be really, really useful because, again, hearing explanations aloud, hearing what children are saying aloud, it also shows you the misconceptions that perhaps some teachers are teaching. But again, you have to be in an open environment to be willing to undertake that work. Let's listen to James and see if I can get James's. This is his, his piece of work. No, come, do you want to come and show him? Bottom right hand corner, can you see the orange? No. No, you come to it in case I make that mistake, because I'll just turn it off. I'll let you do that. This is um, a piece of, James has written this, he's explaining an embedded clause. I'm only going to show a little bit of it, but he's explaining a, an embedded clause. And children often are the best teachers of other children because of their language. But let's just listen to James, and this is his version of an embedded clause. Two oh, can you go back a little, sorry, go back a little bit because it started. Let's just embedded. start that back. Okay. Hi, I'm James, and I'm going to show you how to use an embedded clause. An embedded clause is extra bits of information added between two commas. I'm going to show you how to add an embedded clause to a sentence from a simple sentence like this. So just James walked down the road, simple. So what I do is I go onto my sentence and I have to put the embedded clause between two commas so it shows that it's an extra bit of information added to the sentence instead of it just being the whole sentence. So, if I put the comma next to it, the James, that's what I want to describe, it'll go James, a young, 
and then there you put something you wanted to describe <coughs> James as, so in my case a young boy, walk down the road. So a way of checking this method is by covering it up like this. If you cover the embedded clause up in the sentence, it should still make sense. So James walked down the road. So you know that then embedded clause has made sense. Now, another way I think of it is as a boat. Now I know it sounds strange, but let me explain. Imagine the boat was the tone of your voice. So if it was just James walked down the road like that, the tone of your voice wouldn't change because it would just be James walked down the road. So your boat would just sail safely across the top of the water. But if you took that off, your tone would change when you got to the embedded clause. So your tone will go, James, a young boy, walk down the road. So imagine the boat was your tone of your voice. It'll go, James, and then it will, the tone of your voice will go down and go, a young boy. And then the tone of your voice will go back up and you go, walk down the road. So it would just be, James, a young boy, walk down the road, like that. So not that okay, I'm going to escape there because James gets carried away and then goes to, on to explain all sorts of things that we can't stop him explaining after a while. Oh, yeah, I've just paused that for me. Um, Travis, once you get these children talking, you can't stop them. He then got so carried away, he ended up asking if he could have the camera to take round and train other children in embedded clauses, which we did, which was quite an interesting thing, but that's another talk for another, for another day. So... But you can see how visible it can be and how children teaching other children. Who would have thought of doing that boat, for example? There's no teacher on earth that would have thought of doing it through a boat and explaining it like that. But it's so clear, isn't it? It's so, so clear. So, you know, I've already told James I'm about to employ him when he's old enough. So I think this last quote sums up um, our need to move away from traditional methods of teaching to move off the beaten track. And what I want to do is just play you a last video that shows you uh, Westfields at the moment, our school with walls, but who knows, the next time I meet you, it might be very different. So. It's everywhere, James. <laughs> this is him telling the teacher how to do it.
There you go. Draw the new position if the given object is translated four squares towards the right. Okay. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you.